Well, let's talk a little bit about Johnson & Johnson. I found their call really interesting. Um, yeah, that was a really interesting J.P. Morgan presentation, too. Be and one of the reasons it was interesting is because J&J &J took the typical script of, here's my PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to put it up and I'm going to walk you through it, and kind of threw it in the garbage and said, let's do a fireside chat instead. Let's just talk about healthcare. Let's talk about what we're doing to improve healthcare. And during that conversation, uh, their CEO basically I don't want to see tipped his hand because it's not like he said that I'm gonna we're gonna buy XYZ company but he did say hey you know we're still in the hunt and we're looking for small companies that we can tuck in as part of our uh, our, our goal for research and development bring in some companies that are maybe in phase two if you will um, and, and you know see if we can get some new drugs on the market that way and this is the company that ended last quarter with 37 billion in cash and short-term investments, and they kick off some 11 billion a year in free cash. So they have the money to do it. And to me, it just looks like it's a matter of time before they pull the trigger. You know, I think one of the things CEO Gorski said in the conversation was that they went back and they looked at the 10 to 20 years uh, in the past and said, you know, how how have they gotten their drugs on the market? And you know, 30 percent of their free cash flow goes towards R and D and M and A. Um, and it's split roughly, I, I think it's like 55% goes to internal uh, R&D, 45% goes to external deals, collaborations, acquisitions, and the like. It doesn't seem like that's going to change anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, Gorski weighed in on that split, the 55-45, saying that's a good balance. You know, that, that's where they want to be. Yeah, and you know that that means probably that investors who are trying to figure out, okay, well, what does that mean for J&J? &J? What what targets might be might be they be going after? Um, you know, in the past, two billion or less uh, doesn't seem like that they like to do much larger than that. Hey, they could surprise us, right? But it, you know, in the past, things like Cougar Biotech, which they bought to get Zytiga, a multi-billion-dollar prostate cancer drug, um, recent deals, you know, they've all been in that two billion or less area. Mm -hmm. The Cougar acquisition was one billion, if I recall. Uh, one that stands out to me that was a lot bigger than that was Synths. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, but in 2012, their biggest buyout up to that date, this was a 21 billion dollar acquisition, and it didn't seem like it really went very well. And so I'm wondering if this is Gorski and Johnson and Johnson acknowledging that hey, we have done bigger deals and they haven't been great, so we're mm -hmm. going to stick with the the small deal route. Big deals are hard to, you know, you look at a big deal and you say, okay, well, you know, maybe I can capture some synergies. I mean, obviously Pfizer's trying to do that. Other companies are trying to do that. Merge larger companies together. X out a lot of the costs and, and drop more money to the bottom line. But they're also very complex. They're hard. They're a lot of moving pieces. It's not as simple as being able to say, hey, look, we found this really interesting small molecule or biologic drug. Uh, we just need some help getting it to the finish line. And I think that, yeah, I think to to your point, they're looking at it, they're saying, you know what, small deals may be more profitable for us over time if we, you know, leverage all of our knowledge and our experience for that benefit. 